that he's prepared, and then we'll have time. Then we'll have time for some questions and answers. Uh, go ahead and show the video, and then I'll come back. How's that? Great, Ronnie. Take care. See you. Okay, bye. -bye. Hi guys, it's Ron. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, you're in Boston, and boy, let's be Boston strong. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not with you, but I've had some health issues that prevent me from flying. I'll be fine, but uh, I just can't get on an airplane. Uh, the health issues have been a real pain in the ass. In any case, uh, I'm thrilled with the invitation to share with you what's going on in my life and I hope that we can connect through Facebook and other methods uh, about what's going on in your life. And I wish you a Mazel Tov and a Yasha Koach to Rabbi Simon and the leadership of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. You guys put on the best convention ever, and I really do miss it. And I know that you'll have a great Shabbos, and it'll be a terrific time to gather together. So, uh, Guess what? I'm a Zadie again for the second time. Uh, just last January, uh, we were blessed with our second grandchild, Gabriel Elijah. And it's thrilling. We have a little girl, Ellie Brooklyn, who's now almost three. Now, a little boy, Gabriel Elijah. Uh, the kids live up in San Jose, so of course the Brit Milah, the circumcision, was up there, the ceremony. We had a wonderful experience with that, and our kids honored me, the Zaidi, with the ability to be the Sandak. I was the holder of the child during the ritual circumcision. I never had that opportunity before, uh, but I was invited to sit on Elijah's chair with a little pillow and the baby sitting in my lap, this little seven pound baby. And our kids have been quite creative about their Jewish expression, so they put together a ceremony uh, talking about Brit Bilah, talking about the names of the child and the ancestors they're who they're named after, and it was just fantastic, but it lasted 35 minutes. 35 minutes. I'm holding this little baby. The bris took about two seconds. But the ceremony took 35 minutes. So I don't know what came over me, but uh, at the end of the 35 minutes, I'm still sitting on the chair holding this baby. The crowd erupted in Simon Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, and Simon Tov. And I stood up from the Elijah's chair. I held this little baby in my hands, high over my head. And I said, Hakuna Matata. And I'll tell you, everybody collapsed in laughter. It was quite fun. Here's a picture of it. There's Zadie Rani with little Gabe. Hakuna Matata. I told Elliot Dorf that it should now be part of every Brit Milah in the Jewish tradition. Hakuna Matata. So all you future grandparents out there, never forget it. In any case, I had a birth too. Many of you know that in 1985, our dear friend Jules Porter, Alava Shalom, who was the international president of the Jewish Men's Clubs, came to me at the American Jewish University, then called the University of Judaism, and said, Ron, uh, we'd like a project with the Men's Clubs. And then was born the Art of Jewish Living series, which today uh, is still used in so many families across the country and across the world and Yasha Koach again to the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, to Rabbi Chuck Simon, who was there right at the beginning, and all of your leadership. Uh, it's been a while since I wrote a book, uh, and this past March, uh, this new book came out. Let me show it to you. It's called Relational Judaism, Using the Power of Relationships to Transform the Jewish Community. So here's the big idea of the book. We have in our synagogues a transactional model of engagement. What I mean by that is most people join our synagogues to get something, a bar mitzvah for their kids, 
a, a high holiday seats, a rabbi on call. It's a transaction. I give you my dues and you give me those things. The second characteristic of our synagogues is that we offer lots of programs. Uh, let's target a program for young people. Let's target a program for older people. Let's target for families with kids. Let's target for this group or that group. Let's have even different worship services to attract different people. And hope that we get butts and seats. And it works to a degree. But then when the youngest kid is bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, so many of our people decide, you know what? Transaction over. I'm out of here. Bye-bye. Because I don't see the value in continuing my membership in the synagogue. They haven't found what you guys have. A group of friends, a community, a chevra of people who care about you and want to be with you to celebrate the good and bad times in our lives, to be there for us in thick and, or thin. They don't find it. We're not engaging them with these programs, this programmatic transactional model. And the big idea in the book is we have to shift the paradigm from programmatic and transactional to relational. Relational meaning I have in this sacred community of our synagogue, a group of friends who really care about me, a group of friends I can share my story with. The men's clubs has pioneered this idea in your fabulous program, Hearing Men's Voices. We need to do that now for everybody in synagogue life to begin the process of engaging people in a relational way, in a way that really connects people to each other and to the congregation in a fundamentally different relationship. That's our challenge. So I'm invited by a large conservative synagogue last year to visit on an emergency basis. Why an emergency? The synagogue was celebrating its 100th anniversary. It had been there a long time. It had built a magnificent synagogue complex in an urban area. At one point, the synagogue had 1,500 membership units and was doing quite well. The beloved rabbi retired after 35 years, and the synagogue knew in the year 2000 that they had to do something because some of the younger families were moving out of the area, and their membership had started to dip. So what did they decide to do in the year 2000? They borrowed a million dollars. They had no debt before that, but they borrowed a million dollars. And what did they do with the million dollars? Well, the first thing they did was hire a high-priced rabbi who lasted less than two years. There went a half a million dollars. The other half a million dollars was spent on all kinds of programs. Programs to get people into the synagogue. A variety of things on Shabbat morning, all kinds of lectures, high-priced speakers, uh, all kinds of concerts and events, and people came to these programs and they enjoyed them. And then they went home. And nothing was done in that synagogue, which was widely perceived to be unwelcoming and cold, to engage people with each other, with the clergy, to build small communities, to build relationships. Nothing. So when I got this emergency phone call to come to this community to help them figure out what was going on, I was told this story. It's now 10 years later after spending this million dollars from the year 2000 to the year 2010. And the synagogue had shrunk from 1,500 members to 350 households. I just shook my head. And I said, listen, uh, I think 
the proof in the pudding is that you put all this energy and effort into getting people to show up for all of these events and all of these programs, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with programs. But what did you do, obviously not much, to really connect people to each other, with each other, to learn their stories, to connect them to Judaism in some significant way? That's a huge challenge for us because the 20th century model of synagogue is not gonna work anymore. We need a new way forward, and that's what I hope to be sharing with you in this book and in our conversations to come. You know, let's start with how we welcome people into our congregations. Uh, what do we know about them? What do we find out about them when they walk in, when they sign up? I'll tell you what we know about them. We give them a demographic form to fill out. And on that form, we get a bit of information about them. But do we really hear their stories? Not really. Uh, you know, uh, my wife Susie has a great story about um, filling out a demographic form. Uh, I'll bet there's J-Date in your community. You know what J-Date is? That's the uh, dating service for Jewish people to meet each other online. Well, our daughter Javi came home from the University of Michigan and uh, her girlfriend got her on J-Date, and she was like a kid in a candy store. Uh, she was going on six J-Dates a night to Starbucks. And she's very close to us, and she was living close to us, and she would come home every night after these six dates, bouncing off the walls from the caffeine, uh, to tell us about the dates. So one night she comes home, and she says, I found him. He's perfect on paper. He's 32, he's tall, He's handsome. He goes to shul on Shabbos. He has his profile picture with his arm around his bubby. This is perfect. And on top of that, he's a dentist. Oh my goodness. I, how could it be better? Not only was she taken with this guy, the guy was taken with Javi. I mean, he took one look at her. They were supposed to go for coffee. And he said, forget coffee. We're going to dinner. In the J-Date world, this is known as an instant upgrade. So they go out to dinner, they have a wonderful time, they start dating, and I'm telling you, it's fantastic. He's paying for everything, they're going to movies, they're having a great time. He starts to come to our house for Shabbos, he takes her to his shul for Shabbos, we meet the parents, the parents are lovely, it's going fantastic. It's uh, now three months they're dating. It's six months they're dating. It's a year they're dating. And Susie and I are looking at each other like new, but no ring yet. And we're old fashioned, you know, we're hoping he'll ask for our blessing, but you know, it's a new world. Anyway, they continue to uh, date. And in the middle of all this, uh, the university, my university, American Jewish University, changes its dental plan. So I'm telling this guy, the dentist, uh, one Friday night about that, and he says, come to me. So I go to him, he's very good, and he charges the family rate, and I come home and I say to Susie, you've got to go to the dentist. And she says to me, no way, I'm not going to the, I, I don't want his hands in my, no, it's not happening, Ronnie. And I say, honey, he could be our son-in-law, you've got to go. So she finally agreed to go, and I'll never forget what she said as she got into the car. Good thing he's not a gynecologist. So Susie goes to this dentist office, and uh, she's given a clipboard with a demographic form to fill out. I, I'm sure this has happened to you. You go to a dentist or a doctor's office, and they give you a little form to fill out. So Susie says the first line on the form is name. And she writes in Susan Wolfson. And the second line said, name I prefer to be called. She wrote in mom. Mom! He never noticed it. He never looked at it. And by the way, from that moment on, it went downhill. She didn't marry him. She married a lovely guy named Dave Hall. 
terrific. He works for a small internet company in San Jose, California called Google. But my point is this. Nobody, he didn't bother looking at her form. And most of our synagogues have people fill out forms like that with a little information here and there. But who really gets to know the people? Who really sits down with people in a conversation over coffee and says, tell me your story. Share with me your life. Where are you on your Jewish journey? Very few of us do that. Very few synagogues take the time to do that. Instead, we're busy uh, creating these programs and we hope people will show up and that's how they'll get engaged. It's not working. It's not working. Not like it used to work. So we need a new model. We need a new paradigm and it's going to be based in relational Judaism. You know why else programs are not going to work anymore the way they used to? Because I don't need to come to the synagogue or the men's clubs events for Jewish information. I can go online and do everything. I can go online and get all the Jewish information I want, how to celebrate, how to lay tefillin. What do I need the worldwide rap for if I can go online and see a video of it? Uh, why do I have to join a synagogue and put my kid in Hebrew school for three, four, five years when I can get my kid online bar mitzvah tutoring? Why do I need to have uh, pay thousands and thousands of dollars to a synagogue for membership dues when I could easily hire in most communities a rent a rabbi and you know, do the ceremony in the backyard? Now, some of you in smaller communities, that's not going to happen. But it is happening big time in the larger communities. Um, why should I belong to a synagogue uh, that no longer has the ability, the volunteer time, or even the funding to provide a meal of condolence when here in Los Angeles, there are two women who went into business, they call themselves Shiva sisters, who will provide uh, everything you need for your dearly departed. They'll arrange a rabbi, they'll arrange a cemetery plot, they will arrange the meal of condolence, and they'll provide valet parking. Hey, it's LA. My point is this. If access to Jewish life is no longer uh, only through the synagogue, if we can do almost everything in the Jewish community, in Jewish life, uh, online, or in other kinds of ways, episodic Jewish ways, then what's the value added? What's our offer in synagogue life? Our offer must be a small face-to-face -face community of people who care about each other, who will be there for each other, who understand the power of face-to-face -face relationships, not just Facebook relationships. So how about you guys? What's the role of men's clubs in all of this? Well, I would begin by suggesting to you, keep your eye on the ball. What's the goal? The goal of building a relationship with somebody who comes into our sacred communities is to help them connect more deeply with the Jewish experience. Judaism is a covenantal religion. It's based on the idea of covenant, of relationship between you and a variety of levels of the Jewish experience. Let me briefly review them. They're identified and elaborated in the book. I call these the banes of my existence, of our existence. The Hebrew word bane means between, and it's in the between, between you and me, that we find godliness and we find relationship. So what are the banes of our existence? The first is bain adam lat smo, between me and myself. So how does the men's clubs help your guys understand yourself better? Each one of you. How do I understand myself as a man better? Nobody does this better than the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. You guys are way ahead of this curve and we need to learn from you 
The rest of the Jewish community needs to learn from you how to engage men to figure out what it means, how Judaism speaks to you in your heart and in your life. The second level is ben adam lemishpacha, between me and my family. So how am I a better husband, a better son, a better father, a better zaidi, because of my engagement in a relationship with Judaism? The next level is ben adam lechaverim. How do I relate to a group of friends? Here again, you guys know how to do this. You know how to create a kiddush club. You know how to uh, create small groups of friends who are there for each other. Uh, everybody needs a group of friends to really count on. You know, in the megachurch world, uh, we're often taught that if a new member connects to five to seven other people in the congregation, they're going to feel connected, even in a large institution. We can do that, and we can do it better. The next level of relationship is ben adam liyahadut, between me and Judaism. And now we're talking about Jewish study, Jewish prayer, Jewish experiences. Uh, how do those things inform my life? Those four are personal levels of relationship. The next four are communal levels of relationship. So, ben adam la between me and the community, both a sacred community of a synagogue and the secular community of things like Federation or the Anti-Defamation League, or for women, Hadassah. Uh, that level of relationship is also critical for our connection to the Jewish experience. Ben adam la'am, between me and the Jewish people, why is it that some Jews will never walk into a synagogue, but they'll go on a summer vacation to Rome, and they see somebody wearing a mug and David or a chai, oh, landsman, oh, here's a friend, or they seek out a synagogue. They won't go into your synagogue, but they want to go to the synagogue in the Jewish ghetto in Rome. That's a sense of Jewish peoplehood. How do we improve that in our people's lives? The next level is Ben Adam Le Yisrael between me and the state of Israel. How do we connect people in a positive way to the state of Israel? Ben Adam La'olam is the eighth level of relationship between me and the world. This idea of tikkun olam, the idea that we are working to perfect the world, is something critical in engaging people in a relational Judaism. And finally, the most important level to me anyway, is ben adam lemakom, between me and God. What's my relationship with God? How does God live in my life? How do I relate to the idea of God? Do I have a sense of God in my life? Do I see every human being made B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God? And that's where godliness is found, in that between, between me and you. So our goal in a relational Judaism is to deepen these nine levels of experience, Jewish experience, for every single member of our men's clubs and our congregations. And finally in the book, I identify 12 principles of relational engagement, 12 principles of the work that should guide the work we have to do, 12 principles that I think will change the way we do synagogue life. Beginning with personal encounter. We don't spend our time in the right way. We don't ask our rabbis and canners and educators to spend our time in the right way, in my opinion. We spend so much time filling up our calendars with these programs that we hope will engage people when I think our rabbis ought to be spending more time with our people, out of the building, not just in their studies. I think you guys have to excuse rabbis from endless committee meetings where they really don't need to be at and ask your rabbi, uh, go out and meet our people. Have coffee three or four times a week with a member of the congregation. 
since I began to talk about this, I know rabbis who are doing it. They're scheduling time in their week to take you guys out for coffee, to meet for lunch, to hear each other's stories, for me to hear your story as a rabbi or for you to tell me your story if I was a rabbi. That builds a connection. Rabbis who are opening their homes for Shabbat dinners and lunches. And if they won't do that, have a uh, captain's table at the Shabbat luncheon where people are invited to sit with the rabbi and have a conversation. And there are many ways we could be spending our time differently. And not just the clergy, and not just the educators, but we guys ourselves, we have to say, well, what if I took five to 10 guys out to coffee during a year? And we sat and talked about what was important in our lives. And we heard people's stories. Can you imagine if we had a campaign like that in our congregations, not just to get members into our men's clubs, but to deeply connect with people, at least to begin a deep connection with people, so people understand that there's somebody in the synagogue who cares to hear my story. And there are other principles of engagement that are outlined in the book, and I recommend it to you. As a matter of fact, let me conclude with that recommendation. I think this book, this relational Judaism book, can be a playbook for a positive and exciting Jewish future in our congregations. And I recommend to you picking it up. Our friend Stuart Matlins and his crew from Jewish Lights Publishing came down for the conference from Vermont uh, to help you access this material and other material. But uh, I would recommend that you get this book for your leadership and you sit and look at it together and learn from it and think about how you can apply the principles to your own setting in your own community. I think synagogue boards, I know synagogue boards, many of them are uh, getting the book to read together uh, beyond just the men's clubs. Uh, there are some synagogues that are even thinking of a community read, of uh, taking the book uh, getting a donor to fund it, an angel donor, and uh, read the book in the congregation and see a vision, a different vision of a 21st century synagogue that's rooted in this idea of relationship, in the notion that a sacred community is one where each of us finds meaning, what is my life all about, finds purpose, what did God put me on earth to do, finds blessing, the blessings of family and friends and community, and finds belonging, that huge blessing of community that I know all of you share in the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs and with your fabulous support of synagogues. So I give you a yasha koach on the conference. I look forward to speaking with you on Skype, and thanks again for inviting me to this fabulous event. Isn't that fun? So we're going to reconnect with Ron and have time for just a few questions. So if you have questions, let's see, Dave, where would the best place to be first for someone who has a question. Um, why don't we set up the microphone? Okay, who has questions for Ron? We're queuing up the line for questions, Ron. That's terrific. Good morning, everybody. Hi. How do you like my own home? <laughs> uh, listen, when you have your granddaughter living in your study, that's what you get, right there. Hi, Ron. Hi. I've enjoyed you at many of our conventions. My, my question is, 
that is a terrific tape. Can the tape as well as the book be made available to our synagogues? Well, uh, the, uh, the book is certainly available. Uh, my friends have as they at the conference. And many of the synagogues I know are reading it with their leadership, which is perfect. I don't know about the tape. We'll have to talk to Rabbi Simon. Is he there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, he's here. <laughs> I'm sure we can make it available to the fans. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll post the tape online somewhere. Next question. Who else has a question for Ron? Ron, you were so clear that there weren't very many questions, but we're getting a couple. Here's Tom Sudo. Hey, Ron, how are you? I'm great. Good. Yes. We miss you here. I miss you. In an era of, you know, you talked about J-Day and online and everything, all the relationships are built on Facebook. You think it's a shock to the system if somebody says, I want to have a cup of coffee with you? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it actually is, especially if the call comes from the leader of the synagogue. Uh, I know rabbis who tell me when they call their members to say, uh, would you like to have a cup of coffee? They're kind of in shock. Uh, and I think it's uh, one of the challenges we face in the contradiction. You know, how are we going to uh, organize our time in a way that we can actually connect people in a better way? Uh, yeah, and I think it's going to require people reorganizing their time and thinking about how they can divide the congregation and at least make contact once a year with the confidence. Great, thanks. We have time for maybe two more questions. Al, come on up. Who, who else has a question so we can get you ready? Morning, Ron. How are you? Hey, hi. Both are tough. Listen, I'm going to open a can of worms with this one. We're talking about relational Judaism. We have so many of our young, young singles mostly female, who are having problems relating within the communities of the synagogue and having problems trying to find wholesome Jewish men to marry. And so many of them are going the other way because the Goyim want them more than the Jew Jewish males. What they seem to want to do is engage in one way and not in the way of a family life. We're talking about relational Judaism and bringing people in. What do we do to help make sure that we can uh, create successful places within our synagogue communities where we can get our youngsters together to keep our Jewish heritage alive. So our Synagogue 3000 project uh, had for the last four years a project we call Next Door, Next Generation. And the idea was to have an engagement rabbi, community organizer working from the congregation to develop uh, a Hebra, a small group of young Jewish adults who would do stuff together, would meet together, not necessarily for mating and dating, but for uh, exploring Jewish life. It's extraordinarily successful. Uh, I recommend you look us up on uh, nextdooronline.org and uh, learn some of the lessons about how to engage young Jewish adults. Our next uh, challenge is to broaden what we've learned about building relationships to the rest of the community, the rest of the congregation. I think there are ways to do it, and there are plenty of examples of young people getting engaged in Jewish life in that way. Okay. Look at all the young guys you got out of Ben's clubs. It's unbelievable. Look at these guys. They're fantastic. I guess then if the rabbis aren't doing it, the men's clubs will have to. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> oh, no, we all have to do it. <laughs> Okay. We all have to do it. All right. A last question from Harold Neeson. Harold Neeson, Ron, I want to thank you for helping put us on a new direction with the Art of Jewish Living. You and Ron uh, yeah. Simon really helped change us. And as Jefferson said, every 20 years you have to make a change. And now you're putting us on a further new direction. I want to thank you on behalf of <laughs> Jerry Agress is here, as you remember here. We're two antiquaries that are still active here, and thanks to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Something we said. <laughs> <laughs>
for you uh, old timers out there, look at that. You see who that is? That's my good friend, Bill Porter. Your former international president, God bless his soul. Uh, he started my relationship with the Federation of Jewish Pets Club, and it's one of the great things in my career. So God bless you all, and thanks for watching. I hope the book will help in your work going forward. We have a lot of work to do, but I know we'll do it and uh, make the next chapter of Jewish Reply and be more exciting and strong. Thanks to all of you at the Men's Books and the Sisterhood. You guys are great. Thanks for Thank you, Ron. That was exciting. The next part of our program is on K. Roof, and so I'd like to call up Alex and Linda Romano.